today we are in part three of a collection of talks entitled Happy, Healthy, Holy. Someone say happy. Someone say healthy. Someone say holy. That's what we're talking about. Happy, healthy, holy. And we're, we're talking about the condition of our soul. Not an external change, but, but an internal one. That's really how the gospel works. It goes much deeper than what's on the outside, and it starts on the inside. And we've been talking the last few weeks, and week one, I, I talked about this idea that, you know, is your soul good? Last week, I talked about our lost souls. And today, I, I titled this message today, um, A Lot A Bit Happy. A Lot A Bit Happy. And I want to get there in a moment, but really the premise of what we're talking about today is the power of a renewed mind. The power of a renewed mind. The truth of the matter is, is that as we talk about this collection, we have this little tagline, and the tagline comes from Mark chapter 8, where Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world, but forfeit his soul? The way that we're sort of saying that is in order to gain your soul, you have to lose the world. And maybe you're new to church and you're wondering, what does it mean to lose the world? What does it mean to get rid of the world? Ultimately, the way that we lose the world is in our mind, that we have to stop thinking like the world. Repentance means to change your mind. Sometimes you hear that word used in church and it's really, really simple. It just means to change your mind. I was thinking this way, now I'm thinking that way. And if you're ever going to find your soul, you have to stop thinking like the world thinks. And so as we start talking about our, our, our soul today, uh, you really can't talk about your soul without talking about your mind. The secular world has this term called psychology. It's the study of the mind. Yet somehow throughout the generations, the church has sort of taken uh, sort of a, an afraid approach towards the word psychology. But I firmly believe that psychology and spirituality were never supposed to be separated. It's how we teach at Vu Church. Would you believe that the Greek word for soul is the word psyche? Meaning, as you study psychology, it really is the study of the soul. For centuries, spiritual leaders were called cura animorum, which truly means cure for the soul. Look at what Hebrews chapter 13 says. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, so that, they would, so that would be unprofitable for you. Now this passage is a little bit self-serving, right? Because uh, it's telling the congregation, you know, pray for your pastor, uh, be easy on your pastor because that's going to be more profitable to you. However, that's not what I'm trying to lean into. What I want you to see in that passage is that pastoring is about shepherding souls. Leading a congregation is that we're supposed to have some answers for the cure for your soul. Maybe we have such a demand for therapy today because we have such a lack of quality supply of pastoring. It's a cure for your soul. And we've been looking at this diagram for the last three weeks, and it comes from Dallas Willard's teaching. And the diagram of your soul is that our soul is multi-layered. I think many times we can't begin to steward something, and we can't begin to really take care of something if we don't understand it. So how do I begin to understand my soul? My soul is multi-layered. It begins at the core of who I am, my heart. And my heart refers to my desires and my will. It then branches out into my mind, which controls my feelings and emotions. It then, next week, we're, we're going to talk about it, it goes to my body, that, that my body, it's a part of my soul. And then lastly, it's my relationships and my family of origin and my family of choice. All of these things are intertwined and they're creating the condition and the form of my soul. And so today, as we talk about spiritual formation in this third part, we're talking about our mind, our mind. And last week, as we were looking at this idea of a ruined soul, what does sin do? Sin shatters our soul. Sin separates our soul. Sin 
disintegrates our soul, all those areas working together. If you throw a log into a fire, a whole strong log into a fire, what happens? The log begins to disintegrate. Look at what James said. James said in verse eight, talking about a person who believes and then doubts, he says, such a person is a double-minded and unstable in all they do. What does that mean, double-minded? It means a divided soul. Look at what David says in Psalms 86, verse 11. He says, teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided mind that I may fear your name. All of this is a picture of an integrated whole, happy, healthy, whole person. If I'm ever gonna step into following Jesus, I have to come to terms with that the world's way of thinking will never lead me to happy, healthy, holy. I have to adopt Jesus's teaching to receive happy, healthy, holy. It's the only way that I get there. And we can't talk spiritual formation without teaching on the mind. The second part of your soul is your mind and all change begins in your mind. Proverbs chapter 23, verse seven says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. My mind is responsible for my thoughts and feelings. Once again, these things go hand in hand. No thought comes without a feeling and no feeling is void of a thought. Romans chapter 12 is our foundational verse today and we're gonna use this as we talk about our minds. Look at what Paul says. He says, therefore, I urge you brothers in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Transformation is a result of renewing the mind. Your life doesn't change by changing your life. Your life changes by changing your thoughts. God is far more interested in changing your mind than he is with changing your circumstances. Why is that? It's because your thoughts control your life. Let's consider Romans 12 for a moment and the pattern and the system in which it gives us. Romans 12 says, in view of God's mercy. You gotta stop right there. In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Please understand that there is absolutely no command for you to sacrifice until you have first stopped and considered deeply what it is that Jesus has done for you. Meaning, you will not have energy to sacrifice if you are not sacrificing from the mercy of God. You're not sacrificing for the mercy of God. It's in view of God's mercy that I now stand up and choose to be a living sacrifice. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for the mercy of God. I'm thankful for the grace of God. Anybody grateful for the grace of God out there? Grace is the unmerited favor of God. Grace, by definition, is that God gives you what you don't deserve. That's how we get salvation. I don't deserve salvation. God gives me salvation. And I thank God for his grace, but we gotta make sure that we understand the difference between grace and mercy. Because grace is God giving me what I don't deserve, but how many of y'all know mercy is God not giving me what I do deserve? Kind of a big difference right there. Because I deserve some stuff. Anybody thankful today? Maybe I'm not t preaching everyone. That, that, that you ought to sowed some stuff, but you didn't reap everything you sowed. I'm grateful for a God who is rich in mercy, that he came and he shows up and he gives me mercy when I deserve so many other things. He will interrupt your harvest of wrath with mercy. He, he'll interrupt your famine of peace with, with mercy. He'll interrupt your drought of joy with, with mercy. God gives us mercy. So it's in view of his mercy that what? I am to offer my body as a living sacrifice. 
offer my body as a living sacrifice. Notice the word there, a living sacrifice. It makes me think about Abraham, when Abraham finally gets his boy Isaac, the one he's been dreaming about, the one he's been praying for, and then what does God say? God says, I want you to take your son Isaac to the top of Mount Moriah, and I want you to sacrifice him. This was a test from God in the Old Testament to discover, Abraham, what dream are you after, your dream or my dream? And so Abraham takes Isaac all the way to the top of that mountain, and then he puts him on that altar, and the scripture says as he lifts the dagger up into the sky, he gets ready to sacrifice his only son, but right then in the moment, he starts to hear a ram in the thicket, and God says, stop, I have provided another sacrifice. I love the picture of this story because what I have learned, I don't know everything about God, but I know something about God, is that God, he tends to show up late in the midnight hour. And many times, the ram in the thicket doesn't show up until the dagger is raised up. It wasn't until he raised up the dagger that the ram showed up. I want to encourage some people today that as you obey God, at just the right time, he shows up. The ram in the thicket is a picture of Jesus Christ, that Jesus, he's there to take the place of our sacrifice, that I don't have to die on the altar, that Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. Romans says at just the right time, while we were still ungodly, God sent Jesus. Anybody grateful for a God who shows up at the right time? And the ram shows up and they sacrifice the ram. But what I love about the picture about a living sacrifice is that many people, they read the story of Abraham and Isaac and they think that this man put his little four-year-old son on the altar. Not the case. Most theologians believe that Isaac was in his early 20s. Abraham's late into, he's 120 at, at, at his youngest. Abraham wasn't physically strong enough to constrain his boy. It was Isaac who was willing to get up on that altar. Abraham gets a lot of recognition, but Isaac deserves just as much recognition because he laid himself on that altar. And what Paul is saying to you and I is, he says, in view of God's mercy, you get yourself up on that altar every single day. You're a living sacrifice. Every day you have a decision to make. Am I gonna stay on the altar or am I gonna get off the altar? He calls us to be a living sacrifice. He says, this is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world. I like how he says, this is your spiritual act of worship. Because, you know, many times in church, we think that worship is just like the songs at the beginning. And no doubt about it, we worship through song. But that is not a picture of true worship. You know, like a sacrifice of praise is not the three songs at the beginning of church. Newsflash, God doesn't want a clap offering. He wants your life to be devoted to him every single day. That's what worship is. I worship at work. I worship at the gym. I worship in my house. I worship in my car. Wherever I go, I'm a living sacrifice. That's my spiritual act of worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world. The patterns of this world. My, my little boys, uh, they're young and they love it. When we go to brunch, we go to brunch and we go through the buffet line. There's always those, you know, those waffle makers that they, they, they love picking out the batter and having the guy put it in there and they love watching it come out. They, they, they love it. But I love that picture of the batter going into the vice of the waffle. How many know that every waffle maker has its own pattern and when it comes out, that waffle has the imprint of the vice that it went into. Here is what Paul is saying to you and I. He is saying that you and I are taking on a pattern. We're taking on a shape. The, the batter of your life, the, the substance of your soul is not to take on the pattern of the culture. You, you're not a culture waffle. You're a Christian waffle, praise God. <laughs> what does that mean? That means that the pattern of your life looks different from the culture. You, your, your pattern of work looks different from the culture. Your pattern of rest looks different from the culture. Your pattern of friendship looks different from the culture. Your pattern of sex looks different from the culture. Your pattern of celebration looks different from the culture. You have a different imprint, a different pattern. 
I take on a different pattern. He says, be transformed. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Someone say transformed. Here's this soul talk, transformation, the form of my soul. What's the form of my soul? What's the shape of my soul? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There it is, that all of my transformation, all of my life change happens in between my ears. It's through my mind. Transformation, the best way to describe transformation is by using the word metamorphosis. And the best way to illustrate a metamorphosis is a caterpillar that goes into a cocoon that comes out as a butterfly. The caterpillar is an insect that crawls on the ground, but it goes into the vice, the waffle maker called the cocoon. But when it comes out, it is totally transformed. It is a brand new creation. Can I encourage some people in here that salvation is not a one-time thing? That salvation is not just simply having an emotional experience with God and then going back to living in the dirt. No, friend, there's something deeper that's supposed to take place in your life. It's called a metamorphosis, that you actually begin to take on a brand new shape. You look different. You are not a caterpillar. You are a butterfly. You are not called to crawl in the dirt. You are destined to fly. You're not supposed to have a color. You're supposed to be colorful. You're not supposed to be static. You're supposed to be dynamic. The butterfly comes out flying. All of a sudden, they're attracted to higher things, bigger things, and better things. I'm not thinking like a caterpillar. I'm thinking like a butterfly. I have been changed. through the renewing of your mind. The other word here for renewing is the word renovation. Someone say renovation. renovation. Now renovation's interesting because renovation is different from construction. Renovation requires destruction. What are you trying to say? What Paul is telling you in this short little verse is he's saying that all of your transformation is contingent upon the renovation of your mind. And if you're gonna do renovation of the mind, you have to come to terms with, you are not starting with a blank slate, but rather there are some things in there that have to be destroyed in order for something new to be created. You have a state of mind. You have a mind set. Your mind is already set on something. According to Romans, there's only two mindsets. Your mind is either set on the spirit or your mind is set on the flesh. If your mind is set on the flesh, it always leads to destruction. Therefore, Jesus comes in and he starts destroying the thing that's going to destroy you. He has to break some things down in order to build some things up. That's why if you're brand new to following Jesus, on day 14 of 21 days of prayer and fasting, when you get saved, life doesn't all of a sudden become beautiful. More often than not, life gets messy before it gets pretty. Because that's how renovation works. It's not a blank foundation. No, there was some stuff up in your life that has to get torn down. There's gonna be some people in your life that do not like the destruction. But God comes in and says, there's some walls I gotta destroy because they're blocking the truth. There's some foundation that's faulty, that's not based on my word. There's some pipes that are clogged up, that have got lies from the enemy that are holding you back from your transformation. I feel like preaching flat-footed today, right here. And so he says, through the renewing, through the renovation of your mind, why? So then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, perfect will. I don't get God's will if I don't obey God's way. And that's what we've been saying for the last three weeks. If I want his will, I've got to obey his way. And what about his will is it? It's a good, pleasing, perfect will. Then you'll be able to test and approve. 
The King James Version says test and prove. Someone say prove. Very interesting language. See, many people are never able to prove the will of God because they've never renewed their mind. Say, what do you mean by that? Well, I know through scripture that it's God's will that you would have peace that passes all understanding. But you can't test that until you renew your mind. I know that it's God's will that you would have joy that would be your strength. But you'll never prove that principle unless you renew your mind. I know it's God's will that he would meet all of your needs according to his riches and glory. But you can't test that until you renew your mind. Romans 12, 1 through 2 is a foundation for human beings today that I believe is soul care. That my spiritual formation is contingent upon my psychological renovation. Psychology, the study of the soul. Not something that scientists do, but somehow the church has avoided it that now today we have more therapists than ever, but still people anxious, depressed, sad, hurting. Not just outside the church, even in the church. I think we need some more shepherds. I think we need some more pastors that would speak to the totality of the human being, that wouldn't just try to change people's eternity, but say, let's look at your reality. Let's look at the condition of your soul. My life will follow my thoughts. So what do we mean today when we use the word thoughts? Psychologists would determine and define this concept of thoughts being all the ways that I am conscious. And the pattern of psychologists for your consciousness is threefold. The first area of your consciousness would begin with this word called memories. Everyone say memories. Memories is all of the ways that we are able to recall, remember facts, experiences, and impressions things that have happened in our life. We have this ability to store them up and we can recall them. It's a powerful thing about what makes you a human being, that you have memories. And when it comes to memories, if we're really being honest, is that uh, we make memories and then many times memories make us. That that memories um, begin to define our experiences. There is a philosophy known as empiricism, which is the idea that all of my experiences are how I make sense of the world. And while I reject that philosophy, there still is some truth to it. Because I wonder today, what are your memories? What memories are you returning to? What memories are you going back to? Because some of us, if we're gonna be honest with us, when it comes to our memories, We have bad memories, we have dramatic memories, we have traumatic memories, and so people do all sorts of stuff with memories. Some people bury their memories. Let me just put it there in the ground, let me never ever look at it. Some of us just avoid it, it's there, but I'm just avoiding it, never gonna gonna look at it. Some of us, uh, uh, we exaggerate it, we we, we exploit it, we we dramatize it. I, I don't think that any of these ways are the good ways to approach memories. I think the best way to deal with memories is that you have to face them. You have to deal with your past. Something at Voo Church, we don't just think because you start following Jesus that your past has absolutely no control. Your past, in many ways, memories from the past are shaping sometimes your present today. You actually have to deal with it. You have to face it. Why? Because when I face the bad memories, what I do is I remove the fear of the bad memories. Even today, like I just wonder, what are some of your earliest memories? Tomorrow, my son, Wyatt, he turns five years old. I can't believe it. My miracle boy, five years of age. What's sort of crazy for me is that I have memories at the age of five. I have memories from that time period of my life. What are your memories? What are your happy memories? What are your sad memories? Do you remember the first time you were embarrassed? Do you remember your moment of shame? I have a traumatic memory when I was six years of age in kindergarten. 
I was on the monkey bars. It's quite athletic. And we were chicken fighting, which is we were hanging from the mon monkey bars. And you would battle. The way that you would battle is you would wrap your legs around your opponent. And uh, I wrapped my legs around this dude, and I am fully destroying this guy. I and mean, everyone's there. I'm like, yeah, I'm crushing this person. They finally, of course, they can't hang on. They have to let go. But instead of just letting go and being an honest opponent, they let go and they grab my green sweats with the drawstring and they pull my sweats down. And I am hanging from the monkey bars, naked and full of shame. <laughs> But then I froze because I, I didn't want to let go. And so I just hang there for 30 seconds. Everyone's like, look at this guy, you know? It is a vid, I remember it like it was yesterday. <laughs> Hanging from the monkey bars, naked. <laughs> What's fascinating that we'll learn about memories is that our memories are never 100% accurate. They aren't. But many of us, we're living our whole life returning to a negative memory, a sad memory, a bad memory. What if I lived my whole life from the monkey bars naked? <laughs> many people do today. By no means today am I telling you to ignore it. By no means today am I telling you to avoid it. I'm telling you to deal with it but then some of the greatest counsel I have ever been given about my memories is simply this, is choose to refocus it. You get to choose where your focus goes. I'm not saying don't act like it didn't happen. I'm just saying choose to refocus. Put your focus on what matters most. Focus on what's good, not what's bad. Where my focus goes, my life begins to follow. Whatever you focus on gets bigger in your life. It's like a magnifying glass. Some of us are looking back into our past and we're magnifying all the hurt, pain, abuse, betrayal, and it's creating a condition in our present today that's leaving us anxious, depressed, fearful, timid. I'm not saying to act like it didn't happen. I'm saying face that thing, deal with that thing, but then choose your focus. Why, Rich? I'll tell you why, because psychologists would tell us that from my memories, the second place that my consciousness goes is from my memories to my perceptions. And perceptions are different from memories. Perceptions are all the ways that we interpret the world. It's how I see things. But how many all know today, we don't see things for the way that they are. We see things for the way that we are. So if all you're doing is focusing on bad and sad memories, how many y'all know your perception is going to be bad and sad? Bad and sad. No, it is very, very important today that in the body of Christ that we begin to understand how we are seeing things. I don't know if there's ever been a time like this before in history. Of course, we weren't there, but we, the studies that we do have today, we've never seen such rises of things like depression, things like anxiety, things like suicide at such a high rate. And even in the body of Christ today, there are so many people that do not understand what spiritual warfare is all about. The scripture says that we do not battle against flesh and blood, but rather against principalities, dark forces. Understand that many of us today, we think we know what the battle is, but our perception is off. The thing that you perceive to be the battle is not even the battle. The battle is always in the mind. Spiritual warfare takes place right here. Why? Because the enemy has one tactic against your soul, and that is to lie to you. Not every thought that you have is your thought. Not everything you think came and originated from you. He lies and puts subliminal messages into your head. That's why we need pastors and leaders and men and women of God that know how to rightly divide the truth to actually understand where do I find freedom. Every thought comes with a feeling and every feeling comes with a thought. So if you don't like the way you're feeling, you have to check the way you're thinking. 
Pete Scazzaro says it this way, there is no way for you to be spiritually mature if you remain emotionally immature. And so many of us today, we do not realize the power of our perception, the power in how we are thinking. And so our feelings begin to govern us. Many of us are imprisoned to a perception. And our perception is governing our decisions. I love the Bible because the Bible does not avoid feelings and emotions. I'm not against feelings and emotions. I think feelings and emotions come from God. The scripture says that laughter is medicine for your soul. I don't want to have a church that we just endure. I want to have a church that we enjoy. I want to have a church that we laugh together because it's actually changing the condition of my soul. But we have to get deeper truths around this today. Emotions are not definers, they're indicators. They're indicators. One of the greatest practices I have learned when it comes to my feelings based upon my perception is that I have to learn how to name my emotions. Because emotions, they are quite valid. We're not trying to shut up emotions or deny emotions that will get you nowhere in life. What you have to learn how to do is name your emotion, name your feeling. Why? Because as I name it, that opens a door for me to begin to change it. Feelings matter, but feelings are fickle. What do I mean? How may I know? Feelings come and feelings go. Therefore, at our church, we're not going to make permanent decisions based upon temporary emotions. We're going to understand that we're feeling something, but just because I'm feeling it doesn't mean I am it. See, as I start to name my emotion, I can start to reframe my perception. Would you believe, I met a kid later on, maybe when I was, I don't know, in high school, that kindergarten experience of hanging on the monkey bars? He's like, bro, I was there that day. I was like, oh God, you know? He goes, that was awesome. He goes, bro, you crushed that guy. And he totally cheated. You took your pants down. But bro, you didn't drop, you hung up there. How brave was that, man? Bro, you're brave, man, just hanging up there, totally victorious in all your glory. And I was like, that's how you perceived that moment? It's called reframing your perception. Why? Because psychologists would say, all the ways that you're conscious would be your memories to your perceptions, which then determines your beliefs. And what are beliefs? Beliefs are the things that you've come to resolve, that this is true. I've experienced it, I've perceived it, it's true. This is, this is where I land. This is my truth, which is what the culture loves to say. Which, by the way, if you're a follower of Jesus, you gotta change your vocabulary at some point. That makes absolutely no sense. Sorry, I'm just, <laughs> I love you. My truth, I don't want my truth. <laughs> I don't want your truth. I want God's truth. But it lands on my beliefs. These things that I have decided, that I have resolved to know to be true. Isn't it amazing that you can have two sons grow up in the exact same house, same dad, same experience, but have totally different beliefs? My brother and I, who's my older brother, it's kind of our story a little bit. My older brother, my, my, my dad preached and traveled and was gone most of my young years as a minister. And my older brother, he, he would testify about it, he struggled growing up. In many ways, he believed that my dad chose the ministry at times over his family. What's fascinating is I grew up in the exact same house. But I had a different belief. I just believed that my dad loved God so much that he had to go into the ministry for his family. My dad was gone five days a week until I was almost 15 years of age. That's the fact, but I believed he was always there. In fact, my perception 
I remember playing sports. My dad missed a lot of my sporting events, but my perception was is that he was always engaged. I have this core memory that I go back to where I was playing basketball and in the fourth quarter we were losing, but my dad, who wasn't supposed to be at the game, showed up and made it to the game. And when he got there, he was so engaged that he announced his presence. Let's go, Rich. And his encouragement infiltrated me. And I went off that day, bro. I look like LeBron in his prime, man. Like, my belief and my perception was my dad's honoring God and he loves his family and he's engaged with me. So I suppose as we're talking about a mind being renovated, I think we have to ask, what do you believe? Like I just firmly believe that God is good. I believe that. I believe God is good. Even when I see bad stuff happen, I'm like, God's good. I've already resolved that. I believe that to be true. I believe God's word is authority. So I don't care which TikTok teacher you bring to me. I don't care who pops off on YouTube this week. I've already resolved. I believe this to have a 2000 year history. If it doesn't say it here, and if this is not what they're preaching or teaching, I'd be careful with that. I believe that, I just, I just believe it. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. I believe that God's for me. You can be against me, but I still believe he's for me. You want to talk about getting your confidence up? You don't need another self-help manual. You need to believe that if God be for me, who could ever stand in the way against me? I believe it. I believe that God's working all things together for good according to those who love and tr I just, I believe that, I believe that, I believe that. So I have to, I have to reinforce my beliefs. I have to reinforce my beliefs. I don't know if you can kind of see the, the pattern that's taking place here. In view of God's mercy, what, are, what memory are you gonna focus on? I'ma focus on the mercy of God. Yes, His grace is unmerited favor, but yo, I'm telling you what, I have done some stuff, I deserve some stuff. I deserve some stuff, but God, He doesn't all, I've sowed some stuff, but He said, no, I'm so rich in mercy. What's my perception? That I'm a living sacrifice. How am I to perceive myself? Every day I make a choice to get up on that altar. Hard to offend a dead man. Hard to walk in bitterness, jealousy, and greed when you're living your life as a living sacrifice. And then I'm going to renew and renovate my mind. Why? Because. The way I renew my mind is by reinforcing my beliefs. So psychology would say, hey, this is how life works. Memories, perceptions, beliefs. But Paul already told me, I don't follow the pattern of this world. Paul already told me that if I wanna gain my soul, I gotta lose the pattern of this world. I know that in Acts, the early apostles, they turned the world upside down. I know following Jesus means I live in the upside down world. I live in the paradox. And so while those things might have some truth, they're not the absolute truth. First shall be last and the last shall be first. No, friends, I'm into soul work here. Therefore, I start with reinforcing my beliefs. And as I reinforce my beliefs, it starts to shape and reframe my perceptions. And as I reframe my perceptions, it gives me the power and it gives me the capacity to refocus my memories. As I reinforce my beliefs, 
reframe my perceptions, refocus my memories, guess what happens? I redeem my mind. So Paul says, renew your mind. You're like, what does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. It means reinforce your beliefs. Reframe your perceptions. Refocus your memories. My nephew, he lives in New York. His parents pastor a church in Harlem. He's three years of age. His name's Hudson. And over the holidays, Hudson was having a difficult day and he was kind of He's kind of moping around the house. and He's just, you know, three years old. It's tough when you're three. And his mom came up to him. He says, baby, are you okay? What, what's wrong, Hudson? And Hudson, just three years of age, just a little boy. He says, mom, I'm a little bit sad. And she said, oh, baby boy, I'm so sorry. He said, mom, it's okay. I'm a lot a bit happy. <laughs> Jesus calls us to childlike faith. Calls us back to that original state. Calls us back to that blank slate. Where you and I, we could face the world head on and say, yeah, 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 yeah. Things are going to happen that are sad. Things are going to happen that are bad. And I am a little bit sad. And I am a little bit mad. And I am a little bit upset about what's gone gone through in this world. But I got to be honest with you today, as I have reinforced my beliefs, as I daily reframe my perceptions, as I have chosen to refocus my memories, I live every single day saying, I'm a lot a bit happy. I'm a lot a bit happy. A little bit sad, but a lot a bit happy. A lot a bit happy. Today, you can walk out of here, not with all of your circumstances changing, but with the thing that's guiding your life with your thinking changing. You might go to work tomorrow and then something sad or bad might happen. You can say, I'm a little bit sad, but man, when I really consider in view of God's mercy, I'm a lot a bit happy. I'm a lot a bit happy because he's made me holy. And because now I'm holy, I've become healthy. And my health has led to a joy that is unspeakable, to a happiness that does not move or leave. I live my life a lot a bit happy because of the shed blood of Jesus. Come on, do you believe it today? Hallelujah. God, I thank you today for your people. And God, I thank you today for your church. God, I thank you for this historic Sunday, Lord, as we're expanding and it's growing as a community. We're in three locations, Lord. Today, God, we thank you for the work that so many of us are committing to day 14 of 21 days of prayer and fasting, Lord, spiritual formation. That, Lord, there's areas of us that although we're headed to heaven, there's areas of us that still remain dysfunctional. So, God, we don't just simply talk about one area, but we talk about the totality of what it means to be human. Heart, mind, body, relationships. And today, Jesus, we want to obey the greatest command, which is to love you with the totality of who we are. So Lord, all over this house, many of us today, we are committing to the work of renovation. That we understand that renovation can be messy, that some things have to be destroyed before you can begin to build. So Lord, all over this house, I just pray that you begin to minister to people and speak to people. Lord, reinforce some beliefs today. God, may we start with our beliefs, not end with our beliefs. That's what faith is, Lord. We don't walk by sight. We don't walk by experience. We walk by your truth and by faith alone. God, I pray today that people that are feeling things, Lord, that you begin to reframe their perceptions. And Lord, we pray for people today, Lord, that have traumatic memories. Memories far worse, far greater than hanging from a monkey bar. But Lord, metaphorically, I pray that today you would give them the power, Lord, to face it, deal with it, and to move on. Forgive, let go, release. Release. Thank you for your word, which is sharper than a double-edged sword that does surgery, that cuts out the lies and lets the truth emerge. Thank you, Jesus. Today, your head's bowed, your eyes are closed. There's no one looking around today. If you're here and you'd say, Rich, I've never given my life over to Jesus. It's much more than just an emotional decision. 
It's one that starts in your heart, moves to your mind, and then your body begins to follow suit. That literally your behaviors and your disciplines and your habits begin to change. But don't get the order wrong. Today, he's ministering to your heart. And if you believe in your heart with your desire and your will, and you confess it with your mouth, he says, you shall be saved. Today, Jesus is here and he loves you and he has a plan for you. Your head's bowed, your eyes are closed. If that's you saying, I I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. I wanna surrender all of my sin, the thing that's disintegrating me from being me. I want Jesus to come in and forgive me. If that's you, would you be bold? Lift your hand up high enough and long enough, whether you're in additional seating or the resource corridor, corner or, or maybe you're here in the main auditorium or even online right now. If that's you, would you be bold? Lift your hand up high enough, long enough to say, that's me, Rich. Hands are already starting to go up all over this room. Ready? One. Bible says today's that day. Two. Don't look at your neighbor. Three. One, two, three. That's me, Rich. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. You can put your hand down right there at your chair. Can we just pray this prayer out loud? Say, dear Jesus, today, Lord, I ask that you'd forgive me you come into my life, that you be the Lord of my life. Today I surrender all that I am over to you. Take all my sin. I don't want it anymore. I believe you are who you said that you are, and I want to follow you. Help me, Jesus. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Come on, can we go ahead and give everyone a big round of applause? We just prayed that prayer. Hey, this is Rich and Don Shree Wilkerson, and we want to say thank you so much for watching and engaging with today's content. Maybe today you want to make the decision to follow Jesus. Why don't you pray this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, today I choose to entrust my life to you. Forgive me of my sins. Make me a new creation. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're celebrating with you the decision that you've made, and we wanna walk this journey out alongside you. Yeah, and if you just prayed that prayer, why don't you go ahead and follow the prompts that are on the screen right now? We're so glad that you took some time to watch today's message. Do us a favor, if it encouraged you, if it impacted you, go ahead and share this. And if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to the Voo Church YouTube channel so you can continue to get more content like this. We love you guys, and we're declaring the best is yet to come. come.